So, um, a peek into the life of the endangered forest of it. Uh, I'll say a little bit about our, our organization. So, uh, we have a wildlife research and conservation society, which is our NGO, non government organization, non profit organization. So, we are working on various aspects of research, wildlife research, and conservation in India. So, we work, we have long term projects on owls, elephants, tigers, and forest conservation. So all these aspects, we uh, we have different different project sites, and if, 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 even if you are passing by India any time and you would like information, you can please please contact us, and we'll be very happy to talk to you about our work. So this is one of the projects which has been running for last 15 years and more. So the Chronicles of Forest Owl. This is a small owl, and the story is full of mystery, suspense, deceit, fraud, and more. So it's nothing less than an action-packed drama and I'd like to really share that with you that what has really happened and why is this owl so special in India. So let's go to the history of the species. So yeah, so let's look at the enigmatic past and rediscovery of this forest of it. So this is the owl. This is our main star. It's a small, cute little owl, just 19 centimeters, and it weighs about 160 to 180 grams. So in December 14, 1872, I'm talking about 200 years back. So that time, the British, uh, India was under British rule, and uh, we had British officers working in India uh, as officers of, uh, you know, revenue department, railway department, and uh, forestry, forest department. So that uh, uh, one gentleman called Francis uh, Blevitt. So he saw an owl which he thought was unusual. Now there is a story behind this also. Francis had a brother called William. Now both of them were deputed in a different uh, states. Now the, uh, and William was a bird watcher and Francis was not. So William saw the bird, but he did not want to reveal to his boss that he has been bird watching by not doing his job. So he, so he put the name, the credit to his brother that this uh, bird was actually seen by my brother and not me. So the story, the, the suspense and the you know a mystery starts from right from the naming of the owl. So the bird was so both of the brothers were really you know it's not me, it's you, it's you who's, who's seen the bird, right? And then. He described it, this, this different looking owl, to Alan Hume, who is considered to be the father of Indian ornithology. He was also a British officer and he's done a lot of, he was a civil servant. So he was looking after bureaucracy and also ornithology. So even in India, uh, Alan Hume is considered to be a very respectable figure. So he told him that I have seen this very different looking owl. And uh, Hume described the owl as Blevitt's owl because it was described by Blevitt. So it is even now it's called as Blevitt's owl. So that is how it's christened as Blevitt's owl. Uh, after 1872, uh, between 1880 to 1884, uh, Davidson, another British officer, he collected for about five more birds from central India. So I'll come to the location and geography of India a little later. Uh, yeah. And then there comes the curious case of Colonel Richard Mainhead Sagan. Now he was a uh, colonel, uh, quite a dashing person. He has a very um, colorful life which is uh, present in uh, some of these uh, gazetteers. A very interesting life he had. Uh, he reported a bird in western part of India that is towards a coastal area in Gujarat from where the current Prime Minister of India comes from and uh, that was very baffling because so far it was not reported from that location and uh, that sent the researchers that time into a wild goose chase that oh that bird has also been lo located in western part of India. So now this is India, this is a map of India here and uh, So, uh, so the first uh, the first specimen was here, as I said, in the eastern side. Second specimen and the 
three other specimens were found here. So as you can see, it's following a kind of a linear distribution in this range only. And what Colonel Mainhatsagan reported was way off. It was somewhere here. So that was something very different and rather abnormal. And then uh, people started looking for the authors. So this was I'm talking about 18th, the 19th century. And they were searching for the forest out. And a lot of British officers were there. There were some Indian, very good Indian ornithologists who were getting trained at that time. And they were also looking out for the species. And um, now this is a very interesting picture. So now I've come to about 1976, about almost about after 100 years. And I'll tell you the people here in this picture. This is uh, this is. William Ripley, he is from Smithsonian Institute. He is a very well uh, known, renowned ornithologist. He and his wife, they have worked immensely in India on ornithology. And this is the grand old man of uh, Indian ornithology, Dr. Sally Mani. He is also very well known. So they were, uh, and this is Mr. Savarkar, who is our current uh, board of director uh, uh, of our organization. They all came to Central Indian forest looking for the forest of it. And they did not find the species. And they were all very accomplished for, uh, officers and uh, ornithologists. So why did they fail to detect the forest of it? Well, the reason was that all the skins which were collected were in the British Natural History Museum. So that time we did not have for some reason, surprisingly, that we could not get access, the scientists there did not get access to the skin. So they really did not know how different it is from the other owls. And we did not have the recording, the call recordings. So which is now so important when you know you want to detect owls, we normally broadcast the calls and the, the birds would respond. So they were, uh, they were using the bird call of a uh, spotted owl, which is a very common owl. Now here I would like to just make one uh, clarification. The forest owlet, in, in, it's a small owl. So it's not a baby owl, but it is just uh, called as owlet. Normally we could call a baby young one of an owl as an owlet. So this is just because it's a small owl. In India they call it as an owlet. So this the forest owlet uh, calls we did not have. And then it was declared as to be missing. So this was uh, considered to be possibly extinct because there were no authentic reports of this bird for almost uh, a century. And uh, so this was declared by Mekola in 1989 and by Ripley in 1976 that yes, the forest oil has gone possibly extinct from India. And around uh, nine, late 1990s, uh, early 1990s, uh, there's a lady called Dr. Pamela Rasmussen from Smithsonian Institute again in Washington. She was working on a bird book, which is, and she dedicated the uh, Ripley guide because after Dylan Ripley, who I introduced earlier, uh, who was her uh, guide and a teacher. So she was making this book. For this book, she got, she went to US, uh, London Mu History uh, Museum and she got the skins. When she got the skins, she realized that the forest owlet looks very different than the common spotted owlet. It has a very white belly, which the spotted owlet does not have. So armed with that information, she said we should look for it in India now. So she and uh, three of her colleagues, they came to India and they started the search right from the eastern area, which I showed in the map, you know, those three dots. So she started her survey looking at those type localities as we call it, you know, where they were originally found. On so on the, uh, she, she did not find the bird because they also did not have the call. So the last day of her trip, she was going to leave next day from Mumbai, take a flight back to USA. And uh, on 12th November, she just, you know, it was, um, it was hot, it was 10.30 in the morning and she put up her bottle to drink water and there she saw one very different looking owl right on top. <laughs> and, and she said, oh, this is a different looking owl. And they just started videographing it. And they videographed it and they immediately started looking at what this could be. And they realized they were looking at the forest of it. 
so that this, the rediscovery came very accidentally, very dramatically, and it was, uh, you know, it was a surprise and an a, 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 a occasion of cheer for many of us there. And you know, uh, so she is the lady who rediscovered Dr. Pamela Rasmussen uh, in in Maharashtra, where I showed the where they, they, uh, James Davidson had done it, and her talk is also there about this. Uh, I've given the. Uh, you know, link if anybody is interested, they can see. So this is how the rediscovery of the owl came. Now I would like to take you to show why this confusion took place. Why, I mean, in India, why this bird was there? Why was it overlooked? I mean, there are many competent uh, ornithologists in India, bird watchers and scientists. But as I said, A, because we did not have the skin. B, because there were no calls to understand this bird calls so differently. So on my uh, on this this is the commoner bird, common bird called the spotted owl, Athena brahma. Now and this is the forest owl. Now as you can see, the forest owl has a lot of white on its belly. Though to an untrained eye, it would look very similar because they are very similar in size. And you know they have this white eyebrows uh, and you know similar stance. So that is one of the reasons that many people mistook it. Now I'll make you hear the call. So, so this is of the spotted owlet, which is a common bird, and this call now is of the forest owlet. So it's a very musical call. You know, normally owls have hoots or whoops. The forest hornet has a very musical bird. So again, it's a very different uh, bird in that sense. Right. So the forest hornet, was it rare, local or overlooked? Why was it not seen by so many people? So as I already described the reasons, that it, it was after 113 years when it was rediscovered in India, it was found in certain patches only, unlike all other owls, which are fairly widely distributed in India and throughout the country. So the current distribution of the forest of it, so in India is now, um, so the, the white stars as you can see, oops, so they are now found in the particular region, all, all around this regions which are uh, marked with white stars. And, uh, and to make a, you know, the point very clear, I'll show you that here the distribution of the forest owlet in, in India is just here in this region, whereas the spotted owlet and the all the other owls are found all throughout. The green color shows its distribution. So that is how uh, localized is the forest owlet. Now I'll take you to the second part of my talk. What is the current research which is going on? And what are we doing about the species? So um, there are, as I said, there are 36 species of owls in India. And of course, the star is uh, the forest owl because that is endemic to India. It's not found outside India. It is now in endangered category. So that is the forest owl. We have eagle owls, large, large eagle owls. Then we have smaller um, scops owl here. Then we have endemic other owls, which are found in the islands of Andaman and Nicobar. And then we have other resident species here. So we have a very, very high diversity of owls in India. So now I'll take you to India. Just sit back and relax. And this is, just imagine that you are in the forest and in the evening, this is the, as the night falls and uh, you listen to the call. So, any guesses for this? Great, hey, yes. So this is the this is the corner. So this is the owl. Okay. Now we go to another owl. So it's the night is still there. So this is our barn owl. So you can hear the call. It's like the shh, the screech of the barn owl. So this is our uh, eagle owl. So if you just... Yeah. Uh,
And this is very inquisitive scoff so. You can hear from what? It's asking you what? <laughs> Ledges like this, the barn owl, the Indian eagle owl, the brown fish owl, they, they require huge trees and the hollows of those trees or ledges, flat ledges or you know, sc hillsides. They nest there. So, uh, so this is a background of uh, owls in India, the diversity of owls in India. Now, I wanted to, we wanted to start some work on owls, and in India, not much work has been done on owls. So, to start my uh, training, I came, we came to USA to train with some of the very well-known scientists in India, I'm sorry, in USA, uh, and that is uh, Janice Reed. She is a wildlife biologist with USDA, and she works on the spotted owlet in Oregon. And David Johnson, director of global, the then director of Global Owl Project, and he's done some amazing work on burrowing uh, owls. And he, and they, they're all been my mentors for my owl work, so I really owe it to them that you know we have reached to this stage and we we worked very closely with them and that time when I had come I had a, a fractured arm so I have a cask in my hand and uh, David taught us all the methods of how one can look at the burrowing scope putting the burrows uh, you know the owl scope inside and uh, we were all uh, there are many other volunteers we were all looking at uh, putting radio tags here, so how to assemble radio tags. So these are all new techniques which we learned and we took back home. And this is Janice and they came to pick us up at the airport with a placard saying forest owl because we hadn't seen each other. <laughs> so that's how they came there and she taught us the protocols and then of course she visited us and uh, in, in, uh, at India and uh, this is my best picture with David and Rod. Uh, most of you would be knowing these people, they are very well known uh, people in, uh, in the owl community and uh, David is a very close friend too. So yeah, Carla knows about it and uh, we wish him the best of his time. Uh, so with this knowledge we came back and started the work on the forest toilet in India. So by then it was declared as endangered, so it is endemic to India, it has got dis continuous distribution. And we need to, to find out why is this bird found in small patches, unlike other birds of the similar size, who also have lived in India, but they still, this bird is so special. So as I said, uh, this is the gentleman, Mr. Rishad Navroji, and he's written a book, Birds of Prey of Indian Subcontinent. And he's done amazing work, and he said, okay, I will support the work, because as you know, we require funding to carry out any kind of research. And he, till date, he's been uh, supporting us, so we're very grateful to him. And uh, this is a kind of uh, work which we carried out. That time, the yellow spots are new locations which we found during our survey. And it's a lot of uh, finding a small owl in densely populated and dense forests of India is, is not a joke. And be because, because it's a small bird, uh, it took a lot of hard work on our, on our team's behalf, uh, I would say that we were very successful and we also published these papers uh, in uh, sci scientific journals. And currently I'm working in uh, two sites, in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. 
so coming to some landscapes uh, of india so this is how the forests of india they look like where i am working these are uh, dry deciduous forests they are called as dry deciduous forests and they have teak trees uh, and uh, in the monsoons they look very lush and green inviting forests and uh, there is timber logging going on and because they are managed forest so there are they are being felled for teak because teak is a very prized timber it's also exported outside and also used very heavily in india for furniture and housing and all other so these are managed forests they are being cut for that uh, and very beautiful forests you can see that you know all hues and there are local communities there who live there uh, these are tribal people who uh, live in the, the community in the forest here they are uh, they they and their livestock and uh, they they live in the area they require the fuel wood so they also take it from the forest they graze their cattle in the forest so this is their life and uh, they cook on the firewood so uh, this is the kind of cooking which they use for making their meals and uh, the typical owl habitat would be like this they have a field this is paddy field so you know rice rice is grown there Uh, rice or wheat, and around the field there are forests. So this is best for the owls because you know they get best of both the worlds. They get the forest and they get the prey from the crop fields. And uh, the people live, uh, you know, the, in this kind of huts for protecting their crops from uh, animals. Uh, so they make this kind of sheds in their uh, crop fields. So uh, we found we wanted to understand what is the distribution of the forest owlet. So we made we did a grid-based occupancy survey. So you have a grid at two by two kilometers, entire area is gridded like this. Every 500 meter, we would go with our uh, speaker where we will broadcast the call and see if the owl is responding or not. So the the looking uh, the search for the owl was done at a very micro level. to see which areas are occupied by the owls and which are not occupied by the owls by 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 the owls and uh, uh, this is with my team and uh, we've been looking out for the owls and this is this is what it shows like so i i will not go into detail but this map shows that the forest owlet does not prefer very hilly areas they prefer more plain terrain they prefer forested areas and edge habitat so they like they they want certain open areas and forest uh, or forest areas both a combination of both so on uh, after finding out where the forest owls were we needed to monitor the population we needed to tell the numbers how many forest owls are there in the area which we are working so what is the uh, what is the method for that so as you know the best method is capture and mark and recapture so you capture the owl you mark it with the auxiliary markers like bands color bands and you release the birds and the recaptures are visual so when you see the bird which is a banded bird you know oh this is the one which i banded right so this is what uh, we did and uh, as you can see the the top bird is color banded there's a red, red band the lower one is not so i know that there are two different individuals you know already by seeing so this is how we monitor the populations of the birds and uh, this is a trap which we use it's a bamboo trap and uh, we have uh, on in the middle of it we will so would we would suspend a live mouse or a cricket and we pl uh, place it in front of the owl so if the owl is right there the forest owl it you would look at the owl and just keep the trap here and we will hide in the background in near the near the bushes and the owl will be lured by the movement of the prey and it will come flapping its wing when it comes there that time we catch the owl we catch the owls and uh, and then uh, we weigh them so you know this is the it's being weighed with the towel and uh, how do you make out male and female the female would have a brood patch on her chest so this is for incubating the eggs so that bare patch is a is a, a sign of a female a male would not have a male would have feathers there so that is how we blow on the bird and we see whether it's a male or a female and then uh, we measure the bird we'll take all the me uh, morphometric measurements and put the bands and this is our banding team with all my researchers and it's a happy moment for us i'm not so sure if it's for the owls but uh, yeah it's just for their future that we are monitoring them 
for that particular time, you know, because when you hold it, I mean, you know, then we release them, and they were absolutely fine. And uh, so these are all the banded birds. So you can see them from far, and I would know that this bird is from, you know, this particular A area, B area, C area, because each of them is color coded, all the color bands. So I don't need to capture them again, and it's like, you know, it just gives you its own identity. And uh, that's how we come monitor the birds. So, so what information one gets out of this? Now, as you know, uh, in humans and people, sexual dimorphism is there, a man would look different than a woman. A man is taller normally in, and than a woman, because that is how we have evolved, right? So in all the cultures, mostly men are taller and then the woman would be. In owls, it's different. In owls, the females are larger than the males. So it is called as reversed sexual dimorphism, or RST in short. So the females are larger, why? Because the females have to sit on the eggs while the males do the hunting. If the males have to do the hunting, they have to be small, agile, and they have to go through the, you know, a different type of terrain through the trees to hunt while she sits. So she has to be very quick and energetic, and that is why the 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 uh, the size is smaller in in males. So as you can see, it's there in the barn. So all larger birds is the female in the picture. So in the barn, in the eagle owl, burrowing owl also, and even the spotted owl. It mostly you see that the females are larger than the males. Here again. The forest audit showed an exception that they did not show reverse sexual dimorphism. Here, both male and female, they had similar sizes. There was no difference. And this we came to know because we banded the birds, we got the morphometric information, and we published, we analyzed the data. And this is this is called now. This, I'm not getting really geeky, but I just want to touch upon how we do this, uh, how we've arrived at this uh, analysis. This is a principal component analysis and it will show the differences. Now as you can see the red dots are for the female and blue dot dots are for the male. So these are sizes. How, how big are they? And they are almost overlapping or clumping. That shows that they are really not different. If you take a different size male and a female, they would be dispersed all around the screen. That you know they would be in certain corners, the males and the female. There will be a lot of difference. So our data showed that there is no difference and they are almost of the same size. So why is it? So one of the reasons what our research says, the forest audit is a diurnal bird. It's active during the daytime and the, they do not hunt birds as much. And so they don't have to be very agile. You know, they go after uh, rodent breeze and they are more of visual, uh, you know, attackers. Then they go uh, more than the speed. They attack by the uh, when they see the bird and they pounce on the bird, uh, the prey. So that is why they don't require the kind of agility or speed for which they need a smaller meal. So this is our paper and which has been published and accepted in an international journal. Uh, after this, then we looked at what is the bird eating you know, dietary. What is the food of the forest? Or is it eating something different? You know, that, that is why it is so specialized. And that is why it is not found all, ar all around the country. So that was a question which we are uh, looking at. Now you have to look at this video, just watch it. Okay, so, so he says, and I'm sure all the owl researchers here know that owls regurgitate a pellet. They will feed on a prey entirely, and then all the undigested matter is vomited out of the mouth in a form of a pellet, you know, all the hair, of the uh, prey, then you know, dentition, whatever they take out, it's not taken out to the anus, but it's uh, taken out from the mouth. So please watch this. <laughs> so that is the pellet which it took out. Now it is of no uh, much of not much of value to the forest owl, but for us researchers, it is full of treasure. And I'm sure this uh, you know this uh, international owl center is doing remarkable work on diet analysis and pellet analysis. I'm sure all, all of you know that. And Carla herself is, and Carla and Joy and everyone of them are leading this program. So 
a pellet has it's like a detective uh, forensic thing you have you know remains of all the preys what they have they have eaten so it gives you information on what the uh, owl has eaten so we collect it it's very precious to us so we collect all the uh, you know pellets very greedily from the area and then uh, we we weigh them uh, we analyze and then we tease them apart remove the dirt and take out all the bone fr fragments and then we try to fit it like a jigsaw that okay this could be of this bird this animal this of this could be ribs there could be incisors there could be feathers or oh, you name it and it's there in the owl pellet snake skin and uh, crab uh, scales everything so we really need to understand what are the how these uh, prey remains are and for that we have made we have, uh, prepared a manual also so this is my favorite picture i love this it's called jewels in our land so why jewels because this is a remains of jewel beetle colorful jewel beetle so it has come out like this and it's a very precious piece of information and it's just you know very colorful and um, very interesting picture so it is jewels in our beetle i call it so we looked at the the we compared the diet of three similar sized owl that is the forest owl the spotted owl and the jungle owl which are three small cavity nesting owls so they should because they are small size they should have similar diet i mean they they could be having similar diet so uh, our research showed that uh, the the this is they were taking all these owls were taking five different type of prey mammals reptiles birds some uh, amphibians and insects so i have already given the color codes there so the forest owl it takes maximum of uh, large uh, mammals that is uh, rodents and shrews and little bit of uh, uh, insects the spotted owl it takes also in a similar proportion but as you can see the proportions are different and the jungle owl it takes maximum of insects so you see they have sort of partition their resources if they are staying in the same area they are eating the same food and if they all eat the same food they will outcompete each other and they kill each other they will deplete the prey so here very understandably they have given one pie they have taken different prey sizes different type of prey so that they all can eat from the same plate and live happily ever so this is what our uh, research says and uh, this is like a, a kind of Uh, we have looked at the overlap so the forest owlet and the spotted owlet first and the second one they have 87% similar diet so then how come they are not killing each other i mean how come they are still existing with each other the uh, the the secret of that is the forest owlet is a diurnal bird it kills it hunts during the daytime the spotted owlet is a nocturnal bird so they hunt during the night time so they have spatial and temporal Uh, you know separation and very very cleverly they have done that and that is how they are able to survive together now i want to show you some interesting videos of a brown fish owl the mother is feeding the chick and uh, you can see that's it right and these are all trail cameras so what we do is when we uh, find a nest we put a trail camera so we don't go there and disturb the birds and all the entire day's activities get monitored in the trail cameras and this one is putting a fish in this these tail it and you get all the information of time date so that's also very valuable and this one is feeding on a snake i hope you can see it clearly from there and uh, i was very surprised that the forest owlet is the mother when she is at nest oh my god you cannot come think of what all she will do to make her chicks survive and look at what she's got as a prey she's got an entire pellet <laughs> yeah yeah and this pellet will go inside slowly and 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 
this was really not known to me till we saw this footage. Oh, no. Take the entire snake inside and wait for more now. <laughs> this is, I call it as David versus Goliath because, you know, it's this is a 160 gram bird, a 170, I would say. And it's taken on to a small hair, which is about 500 grams. Three times its weight, its weight. I mean, I don't know what it was thinking, but it actually did that. And when I saw this footage, I was completely, I have tremendous respect for this, for this mother. It just, it just went inside. And, uh, so, so uh, camera trapping, trail camera, gives you this kind of in-depth information without intruding in the species life because it does not disturb the bird at all and we get a lot of different insights. So this graph is very simple, it looks a little uh, uh, colorful. So here from left, if you go to the four, first four bars are of the um, large owls and the remaining four bars are the small owls. So as you can see the large owls, they take more of bigger prey, you know, mammals, like small mammals, as I said, rodents and, uh, rodents and shrews, and some uh, amount of birds. And the brown fish owl here, it takes more of crustaceans and fishes and crabs. So, uh, and the smaller owls, also I already discussed that, that they take more uh, in proportion to each other, and they sort of have separated themselves, and this is called niche separation. So they have cowed a niche for themselves, and they are utilizing the resources accordingly. So now we come to uh, the survival of mating and nesting. What is, how is their life in mating and nesting? So uh, the, what happens when the, a pair starts breeding, they will have a pair formation, they will sit very close to each other. And then there will be a nuptial gift exchange. The male would woo the female, would give, gift her with a rat or a lizard, which is what they fancy. So they would give them that. And if the female accepts it, then they will go for mating. Uh, then they will look out for a house. The female has to approve of the house. It is the cavity. If she doesn't, a male has to still try. And then they will pair and then they will nest. So here are some interesting footage. Uh, so when they sit so close, then you know it's a possibly potentially mating pair. Otherwise, they'll be quite far from each other. And so I'll show you this. Because she did not like it for some reason. 
So they have like, taken a two-story nest here. So uh, this is how the forest started to take choose a cavity. This is a peak tree which I was talking about. This is very valued timber in India, and it is also removed, as I said. So cavities in teak trees are very precious for the people, or the cavities are very precious for the forest, and the teak tree is very precious for the people. So we have to come to find some kind of a balance there. And uh, and this one is the female. Inspecting if it is fine and she's approved of this nest. And there, there, there are two young ones in this. Uh, there's one on top, the two chicks of the forest of it. You can see the top one also. They're, they're both falling out. And this is a mating pair of the barn owls. <laughs> so after finding the nest, then what do we do? Then we go and uh, assess the vegetation around that area. Why is the owl taking this kind of a nest? So we and our uh, uh, research team would go and we will look at the tree species, the height, GPH. We completely monitor the entire area to understand what are the main things that the owl is looking for, for the owl reality, you know, what is it looking for the house. So uh, we published a paper uh, which is going to come out soon. Uh, it looks like that the forest owlet requires a certain dimension of the cavity. It does not go for a very large cavities. The spotted owlet which lives in a joint family with many of its young ones and the, um, uh, the parents live together, they require a bigger opening bigger bonus and the jungle of it again is slightly you know isolated it lives by itself so they all the nest cavity entrance and the height of the nest tree is what they are segregating and that is how the owls are choosing the nests so if they are it shows that the the graph shows the segregation so uh, apart from the nest size what are the factors that that impacts the breeding success of the owls so as you can see the mother, the proud mother with the two young ones, they are sitting there. So the forest owlet breeding success is quite low, it's about 33% only. Only 37% of the uh, pairs they breed, of which only 33% are surviving. What could be the reason? So we are coming to that gradually. Now this is like, this is how they choose their houses, owl reality. And like you know, this you can see the baby, uh, the scop owl. The baby is there with the parents, and this is the first day that she's peeping out of the nest. So they require a certain structure of the nest, which is very crucial for the young ones to come out and be successful as as juveniles. And as you can see, this uh, this is a family of barn owls. <laughs> Yeah, these are barn owls. So they are calling out to their parents. It's feeding time, so they are asking for food. <laughs> so we we have been looking at uh, studies of how what is the what what affects the breeding success of each owl. So owls which breed in more remote areas, which are not accessible to other uh, people or uh, there is no uh, less disturbance, they have hundred percent breeding uh, success. So that is what I think they are very secretive and they require that kind of uh, undisturbed areas. Now, there is, we've been finding that there's a lot of competition for the cavities in the trees. So you can see this is a, uh, this is a parakeet and uh, this is a forest owlet nest. It's very inquisitive, it just wants to see inside and it wants to go inside. And uh, this was this video will show you something very um, alarming. This there is a forest owlet nest inside, and these are woodpeckers, white nate woodpeckers in India. And you can see what happens. Yeah. 
She stole the egg and they went away. So, you know, but this is natural. We cannot really interfere in nature. But this is what is happening. This is what is happening, probably affecting the survival of the species. So, you know, if the cavity is too big, then they are prone to natural predation. If the cavity is too small, then what happens? The forest started feeding. <laughs> 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 she's put on weight during uh, you know breeding season because she's been fed, and now she's not able to come out. So <laughs> this is also happens if it's a very small cavity. And then there are predators. So uh, this is a crested hawk eagle, which has come looking for. So from behind I can hear the forest forest mother calling out, there are chicks inside. So this one is trying to get to the chicks. And then um, there is a flying squirrel at night. So daytime and nighttime they are not safe. Looking out for... And Forest hobbit, though they are diurnal, they, do, they are out in the daytime, but they are also attacked by other owls. So you see what happens, just watch. It just missed. That was an attack by the barn owl on the forest hobbit. And because it had a cavity, it would just go inside quickly. And the cavity was not too small, too not too big, otherwise even the barn owl would have got it. Got it. So this kind of footage tells us a lot about the behavior of the species and what is happening. And then, uh, of course, the barn owl didn't leave at that and uh, it it went after it. Oh. So, yeah, it, it, it once it came to know and, you know, it is just still following the boat. So, uh, this is about the forest type. What about the other owls? What is happening to them? So, this is a, this a video I'll show you was of the uh, eagle owl nest, which is on a ledge. You know, so it's an open area. There were four eggs on that. And the, the <coughs> macaque got to it. And I just finished on the eggs there. And uh, can you see the eggs <coughs> at the back? They are, yeah. So, will he, won't he? Is the question. Will this, this the, will the go, goat walk over it? So, let's find out. So he did not, but it was very precarious and it could have been, you know, either way. So, but that is the natural history of the species. It opens, it, it, uh, it uh, nests in open areas. But even then, these eagles are surviving in higher numbers. Why? Because they have higher clutch, bigger clutch size. They give more than four to five eggs. They breed twice in a year. So forest solid does not in our area. It just gives at least at the most two to three eggs. And it just breeds once a year. So probably all these are the reasons is affecting the survival of the species and why that is why maybe they are in smaller numbers. So uh, so we are working at the forest. So while you're asking the question of the forest, I also have to ask questions about the ecology of all the other coexisting owls. Only then I'll be able to understand why this owl is so different than the um, other owls. So as you can see, this is my study area. And this is how we are detecting all the eight species of owls which I showed you earlier. Four large and four small. And uh, this is the kind of habitat they live in the forest, non-forest areas, along the riverine areas also where there are streams so they can get food. The forest outlet, it occupies mainly the forested areas. The forest outlet, the jungle outlet and the scops, the one with the ears I showed you. These three owls, they require forest, all other owls can live close to human habitation or uh, along the uh, semi-urban areas or semi-rural areas along the river areas but forest on it requires the forest so it's, it is really important the protection of the forest for the species and uh, no, I don't want to scare you with all these things but what I'm saying is that we are looking at the trends of all the eight owl species and looking at what kind of tree densities 
GBH, I mean the, the girth of the tree they require. So our work is still going on in that direction. And um, to understand home range, what is the home range of the bird? How much area it requires? So the best answer one can get through is putting a radio telemetry, a radio tag. So you put a radio tag on the back back of the owl and it gives a signal, it detects the signal, it will just go and we just need to monitor them. We get GPS locations and with that GPS location we plot it and then we know that this is the kind of area, uh, this extent of the area and type of the area the owl would be using and this we will be doing for all eight owl species and uh, we are very excited about this aspect because this has not been done in India and we'll be uh, doing this work very soon. So we did one, uh, uh, this is the forest solid female, you can see the transmitter, you know, the wire coming out of its body. So there's a backpack sitting there, the transmitter, and this is the antenna which is sticking out. And uh, when you monitor the bird, the red dot, so that female was very lazy, she, don't, she didn't do much. She just kept sitting and you know, and just around the crop field, the male would come and feed her and she would, she had a happy life. Basically, so, so and uh, we came to, uh, we, we looked at the timings, what time does it go for foraging, what time it sleeps, what time it goes to roost or in, inside its nest. So radio telemetry is really very useful and it gives you very interesting and real time data just like our GPS locations will give us on our phone. So after doing this research, where does, I mean it, it's very easy to publish the papers and just remain there but it has to go to the forest staff also. So in India, the forest department manages the forest forest. So there's a department like we have US Fish and Wildlife in USA. That way we have Indian Forest Service and officers. And we have forest guards like rangers. So we have rangers who are working in the field, uh, field staff guards and their capacity building is very important. So we work a lot with the forest department. Uh, so we have a program called Friends of Ours where we, under that, we do all our research, conservation and awareness program for the protection of ours. And um, so we have been taking a lot of workshops for training the frontline staff, how to identify, because they are the people on the ground. And unless they know what they are protecting, why they are protecting, they are not able to really you know, invest in their time or interest. So what do we do is, uh, we took, take a lot of workshops for these, this is our staff, in, the, in their uniform, uh, the khaki uniform, and uh, uh, with the officers also, so every time we take workshops, we share our results with them. We tell them this is what the owls require, and this is what is important for protection of the owls. And uh, this is a st you know, staff which I, I had taken them and I was showing them the owls, and they were so happy, because you know their work is mainly to do timber logging, because that is their job. And when you show them about the wildlife and what it means, I mean, they were really ecstatic and they were very happy about it. And I, uh, this is a kind of workshops which we do. Take them in the field, show them how to locate the owls uh, with a lot of officers. So we keep training them. And um, the happiness you can see on their face when they see the owls. Oh, this is how it looks. And this is in my area. Oh, I didn't know that. So this is what is the moment which we need to capture and build up on their uh, knowledge and interest. So uh, like the, this shows our entire team with Jayant and my other field staff and these are the officers. So this is during COVID time. Uh, we continued our work of course with the masks on and uh, we kept working with the people there. Uh, we also train them in monitoring in the very hilly area. It's not easy to work in because in the area where I'm working is very hilly. So in the summer, these are very extreme conditions in India. So working with the staff, training them, motivating them to work on foot, looking out for the small owls. It's a, it's a challenge, but we are happy to say that they are really taking to it very nicely. And uh, interestingly, we have uh, started using owl perches. So very simple stakes of bamboo or you know wooden poles, you just put it in the crop fields where the crops are growing. And this lower photograph here is a camera, trail camera photograph. You just put it there, just invites the barn owls. They just come because they are always looking for a perch to sit and prey on the uh, rodents which are there in the crop fields, in the uh, agriculture fields. So uh, this is very effective in controlling rodents than rather than putting pesticides or rodenticides or any chemicals. So we are also working on that. 
Uh, we are also working on nest box in installation because the cavities are another you know, resource which is limited, as I already mentioned earlier. So we, we go with the forest department staff, we install it everywhere. And uh, so these photographs, I'm just trying to show the kind of activities that we are doing. And um, as I said earlier, this area where there's a, a local community is there. You know, so I, I live in a city near Mumbai, if you know Mumbai, most of you would be knowing. So about 170 kilometers from uh, Mumbai is where I live. Uh, my office is there. Uh, but these areas are further off, about 800 to 900 kilometers. And I don't know, converting into miles would be... 500 miles, right. Would be uh, so far in the forest. It's a remote forested areas. There are these tribals who live there. This is the kind of house which they live in with, you know, very basic, simple houses, mud houses. They have, they do agriculture, they grow their own crops, but they have very small land holdings, just one acre, half acre, some of them even don't have uh, that kind of land holdings. They have livestock and they have very basic amenities because they are very, very uh, areas which are not so, do not have many opportunities. So they just have their own uh, life and they do some labor work or uh, you know, cut trees when they require it for, as I, shared, as I said earlier, for making their houses, making the plowing implements or even for cooking. Now I cannot tell them that you please don't do this because it's their life. And uh, uh, it is also affecting a lot of uh, cutting, illegal or uh, uh, uncontrolled cutting by the forest department or by the people is definitely affecting the owl population. So how do we address these challenges? So uh, this is a typical uh, Korku family, uh, you know, they'll have the, the ladies there, the child and the goat and the uh, person, you know, uh, they're going in their cart and uh, this is the, the kind of landscape. This is the village, this is top view of the village, uh, the houses there. And the women are very beautiful, they wear uh, the simple jewelry and I'll show you um, Simple dance. These are the, the tribal dance. <laughs> These are all ground fires. They are set for two. These are all man-made fires. These are not natural fires. So there are two reasons. One, they, uh, people collect some yellow berries for which they want the ground to look black so that they can pick up the berries very easily. And these berries, they use some, make some uh, local liquor and which is very favored and flavored and it's uh, very popular amongst the tribes. Secondly, for getting fresh flush of grass for the livestock. When they burn it, they will get very fresh flush of, flush of grass, uh, livestock, uh, grass, which is what they require. So for all these reasons, sometimes they burn it up and the, burn, the fire goes out of control because this is all dry forest. So they don't mean to put a fire, but it just jumps. The fire jumps and then it burns up and <coughs> chars the entire forest. It's very difficult to control these fires, the forest department. It's dry, but day and night in this very high temperature. Currently also there's a heat wave in India. The temperatures are very high and soaring. So these are some challenging conditions in which people live. So as I said, the livestock grazing is there, and you said the forest soil is right sitting there. So I mean, it may not really uh, mine livestock, but yes, it definitely depletes its uh, prey base because you know they, they, they're getting disturbed and the grass is getting uh, depleted there. So we need to have community-based conservation. And this picture I took once, this is a typical tribal lady there. So the department had put a forest on it, the poster, this is in local language, you know, about awareness. The poster had fallen down. So she's just, she doesn't know what this is about. She's just sitting, using it as a, you know, a support. So the forest outlet requires the people's support, the people require the forest outlet in that area. And that is what I to show. And so what we did, we started training the women. Because I, when I went there, I saw that most women know stitching. 
I mean, not some people like me. I'm not very, uh, you know, trained or skilled. But most women in India would know hand washing. <coughs> so we started a program in which we started training them to do some uh, owl themed handicraft. And uh, and and also this is Janet who's training them in bamboo. We have a lot of bamboo grass. So in building bamboo handicraft art uh, art items. So he was tra he's training people here, and you see that these ladies. They wear sari still here. I mean, they are very traditional. They are very shy. They don't come out of the house just because you know I am a woman. I could I could establish a rapport with them, but very it took them some time to come out of their houses, come and work out, and you know uh, do some stitching. And the kind of theme, uh, uh, the fabrics uh, we we give them all the things to train, and they make these owl keychains, owl tote bags. So some of the things I have shown here. And you know the beautiful uh, hand-stitched products they are making. You know keychains, tote bags. They are also painting T-shirts, cushion covers, and all these things we promoted for on their behalf. So they get employment, and we try to promote this on our end so that people buy these products and these people get some livelihood and their interest in owls remain. So you know uh, 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 now they started asking you, asking us. That yeah, I would like to uh, really. Have I really gone overboard? <laughs> I have to finish last. I didn't realize. So uh, they are doing all this work, and then we have a lot of owl um, uh, outreach programs where we put signboards. This is in Hindi, of course, but uh, we are putting up for people to understand. Uh, we show them films, owl films, in the evening, and how some drawing competition with children, and. Um, we have some uh, researchers now doing our research. Some so five students have done their master's thesis under me, uh, and we have several publications on forest owl. And this is World Owl Conference 2019 in the city that I live in, Pune. And uh, uh, of course, you know me and Jan. Next to me is James Duncan. I'm sure most of you know him. He's a uh, he's my owl mentor, a very popular owl scientist, and uh, we published. Our owl manual is uh, with him, uh, and, and our ZSI scientist is also there. Uh, so this is this is James Duncan, and um, yeah. So this is the all uh, all 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 about owl night. I have given a copy to Carla for this uh, for the owl center, and uh, we are uh, keep giving a lot of talks on owls. So the last two years, I think I gave so many webinars on owls, but it was very good because people started liking the uh, you know the subject, and it really. Uh, appreciate a why to study owls. We are making a national forest owlet conservation plan. So it has now reached to the policies, and you know the uh, the policy makers have looked at this. And uh, of course, there's a lot of media attention. Uh, they are highlighting. This is all, of course, in Hindi, and there's a lot in English also about the forest owlet research and this international owl center, which they gave us the award that has come in uh, media a lot in India. So that is spread a lot of awareness. So thank you once more, Kanda. And yeah, this is what it gives the City Scientist Bags International Award. So it has come in one of some leading newspapers in India. And uh, focus on owls is what is very important uh, through this. So we are looking at challenge, addressing the challenges. <laughs> it's a young one. So owls require a support and you know while they're coming out of their so as I already mentioned, these are some of the like road kills. We have come plenty of road kills of owls, fast speeding vehicles, uh road anticides, fires, illegal tree cutting. So while working with the forest department, they said, Okay, now you tell us what you want. Now they've come to discussing the policy. So we said we need to color protect the trees. You know, which should not be cut illegal. Okay, then you can paint them green, they said. You tell us which are the loose trees. Identify the trees and we'll paint them green. So that's a very positive step in an area where they are really extracting timber. So we are very happy with the forest department's procedure. And so um, scientific monitoring is what is required. So good science is what we are advocating for conservation. And um, yeah, owls world view that things will start looking up for owls. So it's a very um, cute little thing which I want to show you. I'm coming to the end of my talk now. So a few minutes left. And you can see.
they have an interesting view of looking at the world upside down. <laughs> And uh, this cute video. This <laughs> so I have just last two minutes. I want to show you a small film. Is it okay? Owls are mysterious creatures. They are on the move when all other birds are asleep. They are the hunters of the night. Owls come in every shape, size and expression. They are highly specialized for the unique lifestyle that they have chosen. This is the School of Owl series. You are watching the first episode, Food for Thought. With their sharp vision and strong talents, no prey can escape the owl's clutches. Most owls hunt at night, but there are some exceptions. The endangered forest owlet is one such diurnal owl that has carved a niche for itself in the daytime. Have you ever wondered what the owl eats? Small owls feed on a variety of small prey. Mice, Shrews and birds form their favorite food. This one is seen savoring a frog. This brownfish owl is even snacking on a snake. Owls feed on their prey whole, and the undigested parts are regurgitated in the form of a pellet. Pellets are a treasure of information about the food habits of owls. Our research showed that each owl species has specialized in a specific range of prey. By sharing their prey resources wisely, all owl species live in the same locality without competing with one another. Mice are a favorite of the owls, but insects and mice are major pests for the farmer. By feeding on mice, owls protect the crops. That is why owls are true friends of the farmer. To get rid of mice, Farmers resort to rodenticides, but these can also end up harming the owls when they feed on the poison prey. A better way to control mice is putting up owl perches in the fields. It is a natural and eco-friendly solution to pests. This has been our first glimpse into the life of the owl. Before we leave, here's some food for thought. An owl's ode to Robert Frost. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep. And mice to eat before I sleep. And mice to eat before I sleep. <laughs> we hope you like this first episode. Stay tuned for more. So this kind of a film is what we are trying to spread awareness and make the world a better place for all. We take a lot of lessons from the international back to our country and I'm sure that together we can have a very collaborative initiative and we will be definitely good for the hours. So um, putting our heads together for the hours <laughs> and uh, take away I would like to say good science very important to have reliable results which we can really advise and work with the policy makers. Dissemination of results, putting it out to the public in the science uh, or even public or uh, popular media is very important. Working with different stakeholders, local communities, forest department, researchers, all that works together, increasing awareness about ours and then getting into addressing the challenges. So uh, just lastly I would like to say our all this work now, we are we are working with the department to declare a forest outlet conservation reserve in India. That will be the first of its kind in India. And the forest department is very welcoming of the idea because they see that this is the, the really required action that is needed. And which is what we are doing. Cavity bearing trees, which I have already mentioned, that we are protecting and increasing research on owls. So uh, I'm sure that you know, with uh, after going from here, there'll be much more spotlight on the owls and we'll be able to work together and with this I thank my team, a big team, 
uh, with Jayant and my other uh, my first like Shubham, Kamran, Akshay, Sajan, Ashok, Ram, Jaffar, Babu, Jitendra, and these are our team members. And uh, this I would like to thank and acknowledge the financial support uh, from RRCF Ministry, Department of Science, and the Forest Departments. So, thank you very much for your patience. And your beliefs about you know owls uh, being harbingers of death or you know uh, bringing bad omen uh, in many cultures or many parts of India and we are still struggling with that uh, to remove or to educate the people about it but there is trafficking also of owls people uh, steal owl eggs or uh, trade owl parts consume owls but that is a different thing but about yeah superstitious yes there is and it's it's a challenge that we need to work on. Yes. Yes. Um, going off of her question, yep. there's no um, positive spiritual association with owls. There is. In fact, uh, the the wealth of uh, the the goddess of wealth, Lakshmi, uh, in India. So owl is her carrier. So she sits on the owl, and she goes. You know. So she is the uh, goddess of wealth. So how we take it to people is that look, this if you if you uh, you know uh, worship owls, then the wealth will come to you, you know because Lakshmi, the goddess, is going to come to you. She's sitting on the owl, so you cannot harm the people. So we have to really work with how people think, and we have to bring that aspect to the people, and that is what yes, it's also a positive connection to the owls. Yes, we had a, a speaker from Nepal a few years ago, and a lot of the owls that were being killed there were being sold to China. Right. I'm wondering, are owls that are being killed in India also going to China? Are they being used in India or both? So partly in India also. Yeah, they are being used in some occult practices, sorcery, and uh, as I said, certain uh, practices, in hunting practices. Yeah. They use owl eggs for certain gambling. Uh, you know, They think that they can see a number, and that number will give them money. So there are certain beliefs in that, I will not deny that, it is there, and it also gets exported in other countries. So both ways, yes, the same. Yes? There's many owls that you have in your nation, um, and you were talking about how the one species hunts during the day, the other one hunts during the night, but that's just that one particular area. But that means there's 34 other species, and so are there territories like there are certain owls in the northeastern part of your country or the southwestern part of your country, um, and just that species of owls, or do they kind of overlap? Like in areas, we have some areas like we're starting to get, uh, like with Piper, our little barn owl. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, barn owls and like cardinals came up. The cardinals weren't here in Minnesota for a long time, right. and they've migrated up this part of the country. Mm -hmm. So do you have that kind of distribution of the different species throughout your nation? Yes. So we have, the, as I said, the forest soil is mainly found in the central India. And all others, owls are found all throughout India. So they have overlapping ranges everywhere. So all the owls, they, they and there are certain owls which are found only in islands, as I said. They're endemic uh, owls which are found in Andamans and Nicobars and certain in Himalayas, uh, species which don't come down to peninsular India. So they do have regions, but most of the species, I would say 70% of the species, there's an overlap in their distribution. Yeah. So there is a, because the diversity is there, there's a habitat. Most of them live in the forest and near agriculture field, which they will find almost everywhere. So they, they are found there. Yeah. When you tag the owls, are they alive the whole time? Yes. 
Yes, that is, uh, we make sure that they're alive. And well, I mean, are they awake and you don't put them to sleep? No, no, no. Because we don't use uh, any, uh, we, we, do not, uh, we do, do not inject them with any anesthesia, anesthesia because uh, owls are very small birds. So, you know, they are very, if you just cover their head and just uh, handle them carefully, they are very calm. They will cooperate with you. And, you, uh, and we finish the work very fast, within 12 minutes. So we have this protocol, okay. uh, we finish, we catch it, we band it, we wait and immediately we release it. So, so far there has been no capture of myopathy and all ours are doing well. Yeah, so but we have to take precautions. Yes, you're right. Yes. What sparked your interest? Was it something that happened to you when you were a young girl? Or, <laughs> I mean, it just, I'm just thinking of what I, I don't know. I'm limited in my knowledge of the culture of your country, but I know there's caste, there's definitely a difference between the men and the women, and that sort of thing. But so for a woman to go into your, I mean, it's it's major what you're doing. Um, hats off to you, but were you, was something, something sparked in you once, when, once upon a time that started this journey for you? Yeah, so yes, I uh, have been a kind of an outdoor person, a slightly wild person. <laughs> From my college days, I would like to go on outdoor hikes and stargazing and uh, bird watching. So while doing that, I one thing led to other and I would love owls. I love cats and I think owls look like cats. So <laughs> and they are as mean and scheming and extremely lovable and cute. So you know, I, I've always uh, wanted to study about the owls. And as I said, in India, not much work has been done on owls per se, because it's difficult to study them. They are nocturnal. So that area was sort of out of bounds. And as you said, yes, not many, many women were in the field that time. You know, like, um, it was not so common for the women to be doing work in the forest areas. But I had a very supportive family uh, from my, my parents and my entire big family. And that time I wasn't married. So I just said, I have to go. I want to go and uh, work. So my sister is here and she would, uh, they all would like, uh, okay, and they supported me because it was not very heard, uh, I mean, unheard of. And then I was very fortunate to meet my husband, who was also a forest officer. So both of us had this feeling and he supported me entirely. I would say that I have a daughter. I have left her and gone to the field and he's taken care of her. So he just let me have what I wanted to do. So I had a very wonderful support from my family and a fraternity of scientists. So I think all this has gone together and uh, has helped me to achieve what I wanted to do. Okay. So thank you very much.